Lesson 10, Part 2. Palamas and the Scholastics, Theology and Metaphysics. In the second and final part of Lesson 10, we will go more deeply into the common points, or rather points of common continuity between Palamas and his school and the Latin school, in our case, exemplified in the theological and philosophical tradition that grew up in the Franciscan order in and around the figures of St. Bonaventure and Blessed John Duns Scotus. The purpose of this part is to delve more deeply into questions pertaining to what are considered by many Eastern Orthodox theologians unique insights of Polymus in order to show that if one considers the Franciscan school and takes a certain approach to Polymus's distinction between essence and energy in God, then we find that in the West there is a virtually contemporaneous development in theology that makes very similar, if not identical, distinctions with respect to God and the implications for theology, theological language, and spirituality that such a distinction implies. We find that in the Franciscan school, there is a great deal of overlap and a very suggestive fundamental continuity with Palamas that theologians, philosophers, and ecumenists, and really the two churches need to consider in order to properly evaluate Palamas on the one hand, and also, and more importantly, to foster ecclesial unity between estranged churches. And it is my hope in the context of my membership in the Ruthenian Catholic Church and my life and spirituality and theological work as a Byzantine Catholic to, in a sense, create a theological and philosophical bridge between East and West in the hopes that in the words of our Lord Jesus, um, the churches and all believers may be one in him as he is one with the Father. So in the first place, as I noted in the previous lecture, uh, this distinction, or the emphasis that Palamas places on this distinction, is rooted in a concrete historical situation. And the situation is the prayer life of monks engaging in hesychastic prayer in which they claim to experience in a quasi-empirical manner the divine light of Tabor, that is, the uncreated light of Tabor. And this raises all sorts of questions with respect to, well, how can God be known? What of God can be known? How can we name what is known of God? If God is known, is not God reduced to a creature? All sorts of questions. And of course, Palamas, taking his cue from the actual experience of the mystic saints, defends their experience as being ratified itself, in terms of itself almost, as coming from God and being truly divine and thus absolutely true and correct. Um, his critics, however, opposed him on philosophical and theological grounds with respect to especially epistemic questions on how God is known and what of God can be known and how we can reasonably make distinctions with respect to God and 
also on account of the seeming division that the, the, the distinction Palamas makes between the essence and energies introduces in the divine being. It seems to make God a product or a compound of pre-existing and thus, in a sense, higher realities out of which he is then derived and in, in some ways dependent upon. So all of this by way of review, just to, uh, again, reorient the discussion, not in terms of simply abstract metaphysics or speculative theology, but rather in the concrete experience of the saints. Although the essence and energy's distinction became pronounced in and through the work and writing of St. Gregory Palamas, uh, clearly this distinction or a recognition of the difference, and I say difference by way of distinction, not by way of separation or opposition, uh, between the divine essence, the incomprehensible and ineffable divine essence, and the energies which may, which or through which God manifests hypostatically his essence and thus creates, establishes con conditions for union with creation. Uh, this distinction was known and taught and articulated in the Eastern tradition from virtually the very beginning and is found in every major figure to one degree or another in the East up through St. John Damascene as kind of uh, the great summator of the early patristic theological tradition. And if one wants to study this further, uh, one could do worse than look at uh, Jean-Claude Larcher's uh, book on the history of the divine energies from the origin of Christianity to St. John Damascene. And so by way of review, I wanted this slide to uh, remind us that the theological and philosophical speculation that Palamas engaged in and his followers engaged in and developed was not for the sake of logical or philosophical niceties uh, or for winning an argument or defeating uh, an opponent in rhetorical skill and flourish. It was rather rooted in and motivated by real life experience of God, at least testimony of real life experience of God. And one must think that since uh, St. Gregory himself was canonized, that he also um, experienced the uncreated light, the, the uncreated energies of God uh, in prayer. And he was speaking from experience as well. So this distinction, however, between the divine, unspeakable and incomprehensible infinite essence and his energies has implications for theology. As I stated in the previous slide, um, it's rooted in prayer, and it is ultimately to serve prayer and union with God in terms of the image becoming a likeness, a perfect likeness to God in and through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, more generally known as deification or th theosis. So theology is practical. It's rooted in the practical life of a Christian. It is the practice of a Christian, and it flows back into this practice. Secondly, if theology is practical, sanctity is central and essential for a proper engagement with theological truths and realities and their development. In our example, it was the experience of the saints that gave rise to the discussion and thus distinction between essence and energy.
And so if theology is practical and sanctity is essential, well, then the saint for St. Gregory of Palamas and the Palamas tradition, and then by implication, the entire Byzantine theological tradition, whether Orthodox or Catholic, sees the saint as a, as a proximus, proximate locus theologicus. That is, the saint is revelatory of God's will and interaction with mankind and creation. And you find, um, as I think I've mentioned before in the lectures in this course, you find a parallel at about the same time, about mm, 70 years prior, 60 years prior, in St. Francis and St. Bonaventure. Bonaventure's theology is the outflowing of his reflection and translation into theological diction, the life of St. Francis. So we find at the same time in the high Middle Ages, a radical re-emphasis and recentering of the theological process, a project in the writing and efforts of St. Gregory Palamas and St. Bonaventure upon the saints themselves. And then both men, Bonaventure and Gregory, become saints themselves, and thus themselves become uh, a, a locus or source of theology. Another implication that is related is that rationalism, that is the attempt to fully formulate or encapsulate the re theological realities spoken of or referred to or given testimony to by the saints cannot be accomplished according to reason alone. Rather, reason must give way to the reality given witness to and experienced by holy men and women. Thus, there is, in some sense, uh, a kind of a priori or dispositional humility that is needed and openness to the purification and illumination of the mind and heart by the Spirit so that one can adequately receive the teachings of the saints and then put them into practice. And then finally, theology. In the case of both the Hesychast and the Hesychast controversy and the, and the insights of St. Gregory Palamas, as well as the Franciscan tradition in bringing forth and modeling their charism and teaching on the life of St. Francis, both were carried out within the context of the juridical apostolic authority, namely in union and, and in concert with bishops, successors to the apostles, and then recognized and ratified corporately by the church through the various vehicles of such recognition, namely uh, councils or uh, papal documents. So there are several implications that the whole Hesychast controversy and St. Gregory Palamas's distinction between essence and energies in God carries for theology as such, and by implication, if it carries implications for theology, it also carries implications for philosophy, anthropology, spirituality, etc. So getting now to what's going on when Palamas makes this distinction, we have to go back to some philosophical and theological roots that allow Palamas and his school on the one hand and the Franciscan school, on the other, to begin to articulate a doctrine of how God, how a distinction can be drawn within God such that God remains, in his essence, infinite 
incomprehensible, ineffable, and imparticipable, yet man can truly participate in the divinity in a real and divinizing manner. And so in the first place, in order to understand then how this distinction can work and be rooted, we must begin with what are called in the elastic, in the scholastic Latin tradition, the prima diversa, these first diversification or distinctions within being. And under this understanding of the prima diversa, we can include disjunctive transcendentals. And at this point, it might be helpful to go back and look at the earlier lesson that covered uh, the subject of the transcendentals, uh, the categories, uh, etc. But in the first place, then, the first diversification of being is between create and increate. And this first division or first dis disjunct with respect to our knowledge of being, and being, remember, is that to which real existence is not contradictory, according to Scotus, or according to Bonaventure, being is that which is in flight from nothingness, and perfect being is that which is in full flight from nothingness, and nothing is in full flight from being. If we understand that being, though, is that which can exist without contradiction, the first division of being will be between create and increate being that is, finite and infinite being. And we see this division noted and employed in the Greek patristic tradition. Uh, just one example with respect to Christ, how Christ in his one person, his one hypostatic existence, sees the union without confusion of both sides of this disjunct both sides of this first division. Maximus says, we are astonished to see how the finite and the infinite are found to be united in him, that is Christ, and are manifested mutually the one in the other. So this first division between God and creation, the created and uncreated, is what allows us or gives us epistemic pur purchase to then pursue further questions about the nature of this uncreated being and reality. Um, this first distinction, uh, this prima diversa, is also found with respect to Mary. Um, in the words of Palamas himself, Palamas calls her the meeting place of create and uncreate and the mediatrix of all grace to men. And you can find the reference to this passage in uh, Capes's book, Immaculate Conception, page 135, number 74. And then with them, with, so with Maximus and Polymus and the examples just cited, we find them in reference to a person. Um, so it's not necessarily a generalizable, at least explicitly generalizable philosophical category at this point, although I think it can be generalizable just simply by dint of if it can apply to a given being, this disjunct, and in fact we see the real unification of both sides of the disjunct unconfusedly in different respects and modes in the persons of Christ and Mary, well then these disjuncts will also apply to being as such um, in terms of the more abstract philosophical topics, or at least we respect, we'd expect to find such a distinction. And in fact, we do find such a distinction in Gennadius Scholarius when he makes a distinction between, in within being, between again, these two modes of being, create and increate, dependent and independent, finite and infinite, from another, from itself, imperfect, perfect. Each one of these ways of speaking, both sides of the disjunct, is a mode of conceptualizing the manner in which being 
as that which can exist in terms of conceptual or logical possibility is realized or rather has actuality with respect to a finite imperfect being in dependency to infinite and perfect being. So thus again we find in the Eastern tradition in Gennadius Scholarius, who clearly was a very good student of Palamas, and hand selected by Mark of Ephesus himself, uh, another great Palamite, Palamite and one of the three pillars of orthodoxy, um, we can see how Scholarius uses this distinction, which is really a continuation of the teaching found in many, several places in the East, but for our purposes, exemplified in uh, Maximus and Palamas. And then, of course, you can look for further similarities and verification of the co-presence of this dis of the prima diversa and disjunct disjunctive transcendentals in the citations to the article that I wrote with uh, Father Capes and uh, Alexander Giltner uh, in the footnotes. So I suggest if you want to explore this further to look there. But in the first place, we find then commonly as an epistemic way of knowing and as a fundamental metaphysical distinction, the presence of the prima diversa and the disjunctive transcendentals, that is the meeting place between divine and created. We find both, we find this kind of distinction, this way of doing metaphysics in both the Eastern Byzantine tradition and the Latin Franciscan tradition, and it is simply not found in this way in the Thomistic tradition. And so there's the first point of clear continuity between Palamas and his school and the Franciscan school. In the second place, then, if one affirms these transcendental disjuncts, this <clears throat> way of understanding being as that which is non-repugnant and thus can exist, we have motivated thereby an understanding of unification in terms of concept. When we say being, we mean being as that which can exist univocally with respect to both finite entities and infinite being. And of course, a transcendental in Aristotelian logic and also in medieval metaphysics is not a genus or a category. So thus, we're not engaging neither Palamas and Scholarius nor Bonaventure and Scotus, we're not engaging in situating God and creation under a common genus called being. Rather, being is a transcendental that is conceptualized and logically employed in the same way when we say infinite being or perfect being and finite being or imperfect being. Being as such, prescinding from its intrinsic mode, that is, the way in which it really subsists in a given nature, as infinite or finite, has the same formal and conceptual structure, and does in, implies neither in and through itself, that is, as a concept, infinity or finitude. Rather, it's indifferent to being realized in both or either. So while while on this on the one hand then this distinction between these transcendental disjuncts motivates a kind of conceptual univocity, it also opens up for an articulation of real analogy, not in terms of concepts, but in terms rather of orders of being or modes of being. <clears throat> 
So what's being affirmed then is the analogy lay on the metaphysical, not conceptual level, between infinite and finite. There is only an analogous way of being because there is only an analogy between infinite and finite as intrinsic modes of being, and as infinite is an intrinsic perfection, and finitude is an intrinsic condition of a creature. So, on the one hand, we have conceptual identity, while we have intensive analogy with respect to the being spoken of. So, one is not just simply, again, collapsing infinite being and finite being into some common genus being that are participated equally by God and creature. No. Creatures are intrinsically finite being, and God is intrinsically infinite being, and in no way does God participate being. Rather, creatures, by dint of God's creative and free action, participate in being in virtue of their finitude and dependence upon God and his infinite being as God wills to create finite beings. So one might then, in order to unite conceptual univocity and metaphysical analogy, we can say with Bonaventure, who tries to incorporate both aspects of this question, we might say that ultimately what is at stake here, even in the realization of both sides of this transcendental disjunct, that is, being as intensively infinite or being as intensively finite, we might say that this comparison or quasi-relationship between finite and infinite, or infinite and finite, is on the level of analogy, because univocity is limited to concept and name, while analogy includes a common name and concept, but within the analogy itself, that is, the comparison, there are different natures at stake. So ultimately, we are discussing analogy, but analogy that's rooted in and motivated by logical and conceptual univocity. Thus, we can have, on the one hand, and at the same time, although in different moments, a cataphatic affirming theology, and also an apophatic and negating theology, and ultimately a supereminent theology, cataphatic in, in affirming that, yes, God is being, and a creature is a being. They're both beings. But no, God is not being in the same mode and perfection of a created being. Rather, God is infinite being and necessary being. So God is not being in the sense that created being is being on a metaphysical level. And even our concept of being itself must be modified by or qualified by perfect, infinite, imperfect, finite. So then we have to have in our very negation the development of a compound concept in order to speak about God and creation apophatically. And then finally, we, one can negate the negation by saying God is supereminent being. God transcends even the negation, which brings us back to the beginning of conceptual identity but a paradoxical or even perhaps operistic recognition of the infinite difference between God and creation. So in these ways of understanding and beginning to think about creation in its dependency upon God himself, in this transcendental just disjunct, this first division in being, we come to understand conceptual univocity, intensive analogy, and God's supereminent 
and ineffable and incomprehensible and ultimately unreachable mysterious divine being itself. But it's an ascent or a journey into God in and through how God manifests himself, himself in creatures and through grace, which both are energies of his essence or, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Franciscan understanding, operations or powers of God's being, but not simply reducible or coextensive with that essence or being. So with these fundamental uh, concepts in mind, then, what more can we say about theological language? In the first sense, with respect to God, like with respect to creatures, and again, uh, we're reasoning from creation to God on the basis, though, of certain necessary conditions about being itself, and thus any realization of being, whether perfect and infinite and independent, or finite, imperfect and dependent. Um, in the first place, and this is, again, common Eastern theological um, understanding, that a hypostasis has essence. And if God is a hypostasis, or rather tri-hypostatic, he has essence. Well, all essences have energies, and energies manifest these essences, or essence, or substance. And this is simply taught, uh, you'll find the um, summation of the Eastern tradition in uh, St. John Damascene's De Fide Orthodoxa, Book 2, Chapter 23, and again in Book 4, Chapters 15, 16, and 19. So, all hypostases have essence, and essences have energies, and energies manifest the essence. So, in some way, the energy is identical to the essence, but in any given energy or act or operation isn't simply the essence or coextensive with the essence. So one cannot one truly can say with the with respect to God's activity that all the divine energies are God or are divine, but God is not simply any one or even the collection, the infinite set of his energies. In some sense, God, in virtue of his intensive infinity, his absolute infinity, his incomprehensible infinity, encompasses and contains in his trihypostatic divine life, all of these energies. And so on the one hand, then, through the manifestation of the divine essence, through his energies in creation, either in creating, sustaining, or in deification, and its various modalities, names and concepts with respect to God can be employed, derived, and employed on the level of energies, operations, and properties. And in some ways, uh, according to St. Bonaventure, uh, these, if these energies are of the sort that are fully divinizing, such as divine charity, divine wisdom, divine knowledge, divine peace, these are can be even understood as proper names of God. And then with reflection on such perfections that don't admit of any necessary uh, limitation to finitude. Wisdom implies no finitude as such. Uh, one can then begin to speak about infinite wisdom and infinite being, and we can even learn certain names that are proper to God that have been manifested through his operations. On the one hand, but yet none of these names 
that we derive from reflection upon creatures, even if they, even if these concepts, these realities imply concepts that can be realized and must have be realized infinitely perfectly in God, none of these concepts really name or exhaust the divine essence itself. And this is simply because the divine essence is infinite and unknowable. And so on the question of the names and the concepts uh, with respect to the divinity on the level of energies on the one hand, and then on the level of essence on the other, one can consult the De Fide Orthodoxa again, uh, book one, chapter 12, and then also uh, book one, chapter four. But the importance is, is there are two points, is positively we can understand that every really existing being has essence, and essences have energies, and energies manifest the essence. So God's self-manifestation will be through his energies. And so this gives us purchase for positive, gives us epistemic for positive knowledge of God, yet none of these energies simply exhaust or coextend singly or altogether the divine essence as such. And so thus you have two moments again in theological language, the cataphatic and the apophatic, ultimately to be transcended, not in language, but rather in the experience of the light of Tabor, or infused and ecstatic contemplation in the Franciscan school. So this brings us to a point then of discussing the divine being. And the divine being, in his essence, can be summed up simply as radical infinity. Saint Gregory Nazianzus calls God a sea of infinite substance. Um, Nyssa also uses such language. Um, Maximus the Confessor says God is the infinite God, is infinitely infinite. Bonaventure follows Maximus and says the infinite divine being is most infinitely infinite. Palamas also is fixated on this notion of divine infinity. The Damascene repeats this notion. And finally, Scotus himself takes positive divine infinity as, in a sense, the fundamental characteristic of the divine being. And thus, on the one hand, as infinite, it implies that it is absolutely imparticipable, it is incomprehensible in itself because it's infinite. And anything not that being is finite. And thus, there can never be a, a, a true natural union or participation between the two. It's just simply uh, for the Eastern fathers and Western scholastics, it's simply uh, a metaphysical impossibility and a logical contradiction. So that's, on the, in a sense, the apophatic moment. But on the flip side, or on the, the opposite side of the coin, we find that infinity is not uh, the negative or privative reality of some sort of imperfection, meaning a being has no end or no um, essential structure giving it meaning, as uh, was commonly understood by Aristotle and the Neoplatonists. Rather, infinity in the Greek tradition takes on a positive connotation. So it implies, on the one hand, a radical transcendence of the divine being, but it also implies a containment or a possession of an infinite number of realities or ratios or quiddities or energies or logoi in that infinite perfection. So it, it, it posits a positive infinity of perfection unitively contained and ontologically reducible to and thus identical with the divine essence itself, although admitting of distinction. On the one hand, distinction between these perfections and the essence, and distinction between the perfections themselves. 
and you can, if for further reading, uh, please take a look at the uh, passage in uh, my article page, pages 193 and 194, um, and the other passages that are noted further down. So then we might say then, uh, infinity implies an infinite number of perfections, an infinite, infinite number of ideas, and infinite power. So it's not just it's not just a negative term. The term itself is a privative term for the purposes of both grammar and piety. Uh, the attempt to not speak the essence of God directly, and certainly our concept of infinity isn't inf infinite. We just know that God must be so. Um, so to state state it. Uh, infinity in a positive sense, we might say that God is maximally perfect, that than which nothing greater can be conceived in the words of St. Anselm and followed by both Bonaventure and Scotus. So infinity implies a radical transcendence, but it also implies a positive possession of an maximal perfection and perfection and distinction and perfect unity. So there's perfect distinction in perfect unity with respect to the divine essence and its energies, or in the Latin terminology, perfections, ideas, and power. So how does this then pertain to the essence energies distinction? Well, on the one hand, then we can say that we, we can find out, find that infinite essence is in itself infinite. And the energies themselves, conceptually or quidditively, do not imply infinity. They are indifferent to being realized in an infinite mode or a finite mode. And this again harkens back to the transcendental disjuncts. So the energies truly are divine and coming from a divine source but because they in themselves don't imply infinity as such, they can come from a divine source and terminate in a finite entity and be participated as divine, yet finitely, by a creature. So thus, on the one hand, infinity is really, in its ontological sense, restricted to the divine being as a positive perfection, implying transcendence, while the energies themselves, although infinite insofar as they are reducible to the divine being and inseparable from the divine being, do not imply infinity as such, and thus are participle. And uh, we can see Palamas's uh, own comments on this question in uh, my article, page 205, number 76. And so finally then, God through his, not finally, but going on, uh, God in his, and through his divine energies is able to manifest his divine essence in multiple ways in creation, primarily through creating all kinds of things and in a perfective sense in creating rational beings as images of God open towards and most fully per perfected in participating synergistically with what are properly deifying energies, rendering the image a similitude and rendering the image truly divine insofar as he takes on the characteristics that are proper to God and flow from God in a finite mode. So that's ultimately then the essence energy's distinction pertains to any notion of participation that doesn't want to risk collapsing into either monism, a kind of theistic monophysitism, a reduction of all things into God on a natural level, or pantheism on the other end, which, you know, both both notions explode 
uh, any Christian understanding of both creation and the incarnation and true personal union and natural likeness between God and creation. So participation ultimately then depends upon a kind of distinction between essence and energy in order to preserve the transcendence of God while affirming the true deification of created persons. And since the energies are not separate or separable from the divine being, it's difficult to see how Palamas could affirm a real distinction between the divine essence and divine energies. Because remember, as I noted in the previous lecture, that a real distinction implies actual independence and or separability. Well, certainly, the divine energies are in no way independent from the divine essence. In fact, the energies are, by definition, manifestations of that divine essence. They're, by definition, manifestations of any essence uh, that has energies. And secondly, they're not separable. And so this is why it makes sense to see the essence energies distinction as primarily a formal distinction. That is, objective distinction between irreducible realities as concepts and realities that impose themselves on the mind and thus the mind recognizes their distinction. But this distinction is already situated within a more radical unity, a real unity in a positive essence, in the case of God, a positively infinite essence that is radically transcend transcendent. So thus it motivates, coupled with the three or four facts we've already noted about the prima diversa, the disjunctive transcendentals, um, the formal distinction, excuse me, not, not the formal distinction, but um, the the questions pertaining to univocity and analogy and positive infinity, it seems then these this distinction between essence and energy is most closely maps onto the formal distinction that one finds in Bonaventure and most clearly articulated in Scotus. And this attribution, though resisted in many quarters in uh, orthodox theological and, and historical scholarship, has also been affirmed and recognized by many competent scholars as well, most notab notably Pavel Florensky, um, the Polish philosopher Pavel Rojek, R-O-J-E-K, whose work can be found on academia.edu, um, Martin Tweedale, um, Christian Kapes, uh, Father Peter Damian Fellner, and uh, myself with respect to this question. And also, don't forget John Milbank, who gets the formal distinction all wrong, but rightly sees that the distinction is the formal distinction. And on the other hand, Ludovicus, who denies it's a formal distinction because of Polymus's description of a formal distinction, nevertheless explains the distinction between essence and energies in a manner that is fundamentally compatible with Scotus's formal distinction. So um, this suggests, again, a fundamental metaphysical continuity then between the Polymite school and the Franciscan school. The Polymite school being dogmatic in the Byzantine East and the Franciscan school being one of two main acceptable and canonically recognized and approved ways of doing dogmatic theology and speculative metaphysics.
So having ended our previous slide with participation, well, what is the ultimate goal? Well, it began it, where it ends. It, it ends in the image becoming a similitude by becoming like God through participation in the uncreated energies so that a person might experience the uncreated light and undergo theosis and truly be divinized. So the image through and on account of prayer and a mode of prayer which is made possible by the objective distinction between God's essence and his participle energies makes it possible for the image to become a likeness through a qualitative yet not numerical a numerical identity insofar as identity of quality, but numerical distinction with respect to substantial existence and hypostatic existence, a qualitative identity with God in a synergistic participation with the deifying energies and perfections that conforms us to Christ in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so thus, it opens up a way for participation in God within God's transcendence and for God to remain transcendent within the imminent participation in him of his creatures who have been and are being deified. And then finally, because God is infinite and his infinity infinitely transcends any measure of attainment, even maximally perfect on the part of a created entity, this union with God, even in the final state, the beatific state, is not simply a static point of arrival. Rather, with Maximus and Nyssa, and Palamas, who implicitly follows Maxima and Nisus on this, on this point, beatitude implies a kind of stable motion in the energies of God in the language of Maximus as the soul circulates or circles around the infinite essence of God in his energies for all eternity. And this motion, then, is with respect to to the finite, infinite distinction between God and man, and implies an internal, an, an, an internal and eternal intensification of our already perfect love in union with God and beatitude. So thus, on the one hand, the essence energy's distinction is rooted in necessary epistemic and metaphysical distinctions going all the way back to the prima diversa and the disjunctive transcendentals and our arrival at that fundamental distinction between infinite being and finite being, there remains a poirier and paradox throughout this account because we have to affirm that even in our most perfect state, our most perfect state is never simply static, but rather in terms of its very perfect perfection can and must intensify because of God's infinite perfection and our finite participation in that perfection, which can never measure up or capture God's infinity. Rather, we are captured by God in his perfection, and we truly possess God in our participation in and through his energies and perfection and our divinization. So God captures us and possesses us and encompasses us in his infinity. And we truly possess God in becoming like God through his energies. So in summation, we can go back and look at those texts from Schneider that opened up our essay, which 
presented a kind of consensus about the relationship between Palamas and the Christian West and challenged them on the basis of our own analysis and comparison between the fundamental continuities and motivations that bring Palamas and his school close, if not in essential continuity, to and with the Franciscan school of theology and philosophy. So just to revisit and refresh what's at stake, I will just go ahead and reread the texts from Schneider, which I included in the previous lecture. So beginning, Schneider says, For most contemporary Orthodox theologians, the distinction between the divine essence and energies belongs to the very core of the Orthodox tradition and has no direct equivalent in the West. Going on, he says, David Bradshaw, Constantinos, Athanasopoulos, and Nicholas Ludovicos share the view that the essence-energy distinction is a key doctrine in the Orthodox tradition that is without parallel in the West. Well, I think one is legitimately voted, uh, motivated by the evidence to beg to differ and to argue that no, in fact, in the Franciscan school in the West, one finds similar distinctions and a fundamental metaphysical continuity with Palamas. And thus we can conclude that Western, that is scholastic thought, had access and made use of Eastern sources, which resulted in an independent and coaxial development in theology and metaphysical metaphysics that parallels Palamas. We can also conclude that Thomas and Thomism isn't, and perhaps shouldn't be in this, especially in this domain, the sole voice in and of the West, and there remains a need to explore ecumenical discussion along the lines of a Palamite Franciscan mode of inquiry. And finally, until this is accomplished, there can be no final word on the place and uniqueness of Palamas. With respect to both his theology in itself and Western theology in relation to the potential correspondences between his thought and the, the school of his thought and Francis Bonaventure Scotus and Franciscanism. <laughs>